Uh, it is such a pleasure to have you all here today. My name is Chara Torres Spellacy. I'm an attorney at the Brennan Center, where I work on the issue of money and politics. And just so that we are all on the same page, I wanted to reiterate the central holding of Citizens United. It says that uh, corporations and unions can spend their treasury funds on electioneering communications and independent expenditures. Back in the world of plain English, that means that corporations can buy political ads. And this is a change. Uh, this is a change that uh, takes us back to basically 1947. And one of the ways that I explain this, because I talk about Citizens United all over the country, and Sometimes I'm talking to people who are experts in campaign finance law, and sometimes I'm talking to people who are experts in corporate law. But the one metaphor that I find that everyone can sort of wrap their heads around is this one. Before Citizens United, if a CEO of a publicly traded company wanted to buy a political ad in a federal election, they had to reach into their pocket and pull out their personal checkbook and then they could write a check as big as they wanted uh, to purchase a political ad in a federal election. And, and that's the Buckley right. But after Citizens United, you can use the other hand. You can reach into your other pocket if you're a CEO and pull out the corporate checkbook, the one that has the corporate logo, the one where the bill does not go to the CEO's house. And I think this is the paradigm shift for me. And it means that uh, corporate managers can spend what Bra Justice Brandeis used to call other people's money in politics. And I really fear that this is one of the situations where the incentives run entirely the wrong way. On the one hand, it may encourage arms race spending among corporate competitors, because you don't want to be the odd man out who isn't spending and giving. On the other hand, there's an incentive for dark spending, for non-transparent spending, where you spend, but you don't put your name on, on the advertisement. And for me, this raises a host of corporate governance issues. And fortunately for us, we have some of the world's uh, corporate and securities experts to help us muddle through this new legal terrain. I'm going to introduce the panel before I hand it over to Professor Jackson. Uh, Robert Jackson is a professor of corporate law at Columbia Law School. Uh, Chancellor William Allen is counsel at Wachtell Lipton, Rosen, and Katz. Uh, he is the former chief judge of the Court of Chancellery of the State of Delaware and uh, the head of the NYU Center for Law and Business. Uh, professor Coates, uh, John Coates, is a professor of law and economics at Harvard. And uh, Jennifer Taub is currently a professor at the Eisenberg School of Management at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And she is incoming faculty at Vermont Law School in the fall. Professor Jackson, could you start us off? Sure, thank you very much. And I want to start by saying uh, how delighted I am to be here and how important this, uh, this conference and this discussion is to this, um, this issue that's just emerging for those of us in the corporate and securities law area. Um, one thing that you'll hear from us today is we're going to be corporate law scholars uh, a little bit outside the ambit of our expertise because we're trying to talk a little bit uh, and intelligently about election law, but we'll do, the best, uh, we'll do the best we can and I'll certainly try and, and offer up um, some, some, some insights about this, this difficult and important issue. So. I think it's important to start by distinguishing what Citizens United says and what it doesn't. What Citizens United holds, as Shara just pointed out, is that corporations are entitled to spend corporate funds on political speech, or if you prefer, limitations on this kind of spending will be a foul of the First Amendment. What it doesn't tell us, what Citizens United doesn't say, is how corporations decide whether or not to use this power and how it will be used if they do. And this is the issue I'd like to give some attention to today, and I think the panel will, uh, will, will talk about. 
Now, we have a large body of law in corporate law that tells us generally how corporations make decisions. In general, this body of law uses what we call the business judgment rule, which says that directors and executives get to decide how corporations are run. And this is a good rule uh, for uh, decisions uh, that are made on a day-to-day -day business basis of the corporation. Why? Because in general, we think that directors and executives, the insiders of a corporation, have superior information to shareholders. And it's a good rule to let them make their decisions, more or less not subject to oversight by other entities. But there are many important exceptions to this rule, recognized both by the Delaware courts and by the Congress over the years, where we don't allow directors and executives to make these kinds of decisions without some oversight and participation by other constituents. So for example, share, corporate law gives shareholders the right to vote on certain fundamental transactions, like mergers and acquisitions. The law also requires that independent directors oversee some decisions, like executive pay decisions, for example, where the interests of directors and shareholders are not perfectly aligned. And the law also requires special disclosure with some decisions. Uh, corporate uh, officials, directors, and executives are allowed to make some decisions, but they have to tell shareholders in very express, detailed terms exactly what they've done. And those tend to be situations like, for example, uh, transactions where directors uh, have a personal conflict. These have to be disclosed to shareholders in many cases. So really, we have two sets of corporate law rules for, this, for deciding who decides what a corporation does. One set, the business judgment rule, generally applies to day-to-day -to -day business decisions. Another set, the kind of exception rules I've described, apply to other kinds of decisions where the interests of directors and executives are not perfectly aligned with those of shareholders. And the question I'd like to focus on today is what kind of decision is the decision to spend corporate money on politics? And I think it's clear that this is the kind of special decision to which special rules should apply. And I'll give you a number of reasons why I think that's true. First, there are at least some political spending situations where directors and executives' interests will not be the same as those of shareholders. Now, there are many, to be sure, where the interests of directors and executives will be perfectly aligned with those of shareholders. Here I have in mind decisions like the decision to lobby uh, a federal agency for rules favorable to your industry. There, I think there might be some case that directors and shareholders have the same interest in mind. But I can think of lots of situations that don't fit that case. And here I have in mind donations directly to corporate, uh, to political candidates, like the ones that issue in the Citizens United case itself. Well, for example, you can imagine a situation where the CEO of a corporation is a Democrat who wants to run someday for the House of Representatives in a liberal district. And you can imagine another corporation where you have a CEO who's a conservative Republican who wants to run someday for the House in a conservative district. And you can imagine that the, the decisions this, these CEOs will make about what, whether and how to give money to political causes will be very, very distant from the interests of shareholders in a case like this. They'll have their own interests in mind. And because we don't think that shareholders choose their investments based on the politics of the CEO, at least I don't, you kind of get the sense that you're not going to have decisions that are completely aligned with the, the interests of shareholders. Another reason why the interests might not be aligned in the way you'd expect is that these decisions are actually of, of, of considerable financial significance. I mean, one argument to use the business judgment rule to defer to directors and executives would be that these are small decisions. This is small potatoes for most public corporations. I guess I have two things to say about that. The first is that on the numbers, to the extent we have any understanding of what corporations are doing in this area, that's actually just not true. Hundreds of millions of dollars are spent each year uh, on, uh, by corporations on politics, both through intermediaries and through corporate political action committees. And I think Professor Coates will give you a better idea of exactly what those numbers look like. But what I'll say for now is that these decisions actually have pretty substantial financial significance. But even if that weren't true, the thing I'd want you to focus on would be that they have special expressive significance. That shareholders might care about these decisions in a way they don't care about other day-to-day -day business decisions. And for this reason, we think that they're special, different from the ordinary business decisions that we usually in corporate law give deference to directors and executives on. So in a paper that I published with Lucen Bebchuk in the Harvard Law Review in the fall, I proposed a number of special rules drawn from existing corporate law, all the kinds of special rules that I described to you at the outset, that we could use to help align the decisions that corporations make on political spending with the interests of shareholders. And I'll just summarize them briefly. The first is that shareholders should be given a right to vote on corporate political spending. Now, I'm sort of happy to consider the actual, the, the, the precise nature of the rule, but I'd, I'd say two things about what I'd want in this respect. First, I'd want shareholders to have some kind of say 
about the aggregate amount of spending a corporation does. And by the way, as Charles pointed out in her excellent work for the Brennan Center, this is not an unusual rule in the world. The United Kingdom has had a rule like this for some time. But I'd want more than that, actually. That wouldn't be enough for me. And the reason is that giving shareholders the right to say yes or no on the aggregate budget leaves a lot of room for spending under that budget that's totally contrary to shareholder interests. So I'd want to change corporate law to allow shareholders to vote on bylaws that would bind the corporation as to who can receive money that's being spent uh, uh, in politics. So these are the kinds of uh, rules I would, I would offer up for shareholder voting. But in addition to that, I'd want to give uh, oversight for these decisions within the corporation to independent directors. Uh, one more thing I'd want to say about shareholder voting, by the way. To the extent that this seems extraordinary, remember that the Congress has just last year passed a new, a new rule in the Dodd-Frank Act that's going to give shareholders a vote on executive compensation. So it's not at all uncommon to take this kind of special decision and give shareholders a say. Uh, and as corporate law has been changing over the last few years, it's totally consistent uh, with the, the direction that corporate law has been moving. With respect to independence of directors, I would give oversight of these decisions not to executives, but instead to directors who are independent from them. As I mentioned earlier, we already do this in corporate law with respect to a number of types of decisions, sometimes mergers and acquisitions where there's a conflict at issue, always executive pay as a matter of federal law. And I would allow independent directors to oversee corporate political spending for exactly the reason you'd expect, again, that the interests of directors and executives are not perfectly aligned with shareholders. Now, an answer that you might hear from corporate lawyers about these kinds of proposals is that we don't need to worry about all of this because for two reasons. First, markets will naturally wash out political spending that's not in shareholder interests. And the reason they'll do this is that market prices and the market for corporate control keeps close watch over directors who make mistakes with respect to shareholder money and punishes them over time. We should expect over time markets will get rid of this problem. Another reason uh, is that uh, shareholders have the right to elect directors in, in Delaware, and most corporations have annual elections for directors. For this reason, if shareholders don't like what directors are doing, they can simply uh, throw them out over time. The reason I think that this doesn't work in this area brings me to my third reform that I would make in this area, which is to add disclosure. To the extent that you don't believe that shareholders and directors need special rules in this area because of markets or directors' elections, at least you'll agree that shareholders have to know what's happening in order to do something about it. They need to actually have a sense for what's happening on political spending in order to change director elections, in order for markets to work with respect to decreasing these, uh, this kind of spending, or uh, rather cabining it to the interests of shareholders. And so I would say that we need to have much more robust disclosure, and I would say that any shareholder voting proposal, including the current Shareholder Protection Act, needs to be accompanied by much more extensive disclosure in this area. For the paper that I wrote in the fall, and I know John can say more about this, I tried very hard to come up with information on exactly what corporations are spending in this area. And all I can say is that the disclosure regime is astonishingly incomplete. It's true that you can look through Form uh, 990s, for example, and try and pull out information about what corporations are doing, but it's extremely difficult. The data we do have are about corporate PACs, which are, of course, a different question, really, from the use of the corporate treasury for corporate political speech. And so I'd say that we need a much more robust disclosure regime, in particular with respect to donations to intermediaries that engage in political spending, which we show in the paper actually seems to be a very, very large source of corporate political speech. So I guess I'd summarize just by saying that whatever you think in this area, there's no reason as a matter of corporate law, to my mind, to think of this as the kind of ordinary day-to-day -day business decision to which directors should be given business judgment deference. Instead, this is the kind of special decision over which we've always given different types of constituencies supervisory power over the board of directors. And the kinds of changes we should make in this area in the wake of Citizens United will focus not on its principle holding as to what corporations will do, but this is a question I've raised today, which is who decides how corporations will use this power. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chancellor Allen. Uh, well, I too am delighted to be here, and I have to immediately disclaim any expertise on either election law, constitutional law, or how to get here. It took me a little while, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm happy to be here. Uh, uh, I, I'm more skeptical than probably anyone in the room that there's a problem. So I, I, I'll be a discordant note, I suppose, in, in the conversation uh, today. The, the title for this panel is Can Shareholders Save Our Democracy? 
if our democracy is in trouble, shareholders are not the place to go to <laughs> save it. Modern uh, security markets a turnover with a very great rapidity. They're owned, uh, the stocks are owned internationally. They're owned by hedge funds, by large institutions. Uh, these are not the, the institutions that if there is a problem with the democracy that we can reliably depend upon. Now, my big question is, is there a real problem uh, from corporations making political contributions under the change in the law that Citizens United uh, brought about? Uh, the arguments that Robert uh, makes, for example, which I don't oppose, by the way, I not normal, Normatively, I believe business corporations should not be in the business of making political contributions. It's not the, what the institution is uh, designed for. Uh, but I don't think there's a huge problem. The reason I think, in the absence of proof otherwise, that there's a huge problem is not because of the markets for corporate control, which are very imperfect, take a long time to work out. It's because business corporations and the corporation that was involved in the Citizens United uh, case was not a business corporation. It was an expressive organization designed to make political points, which seems to be a completely different kind of institution than a business corporation. Business corporations uh, operate uh, with a lot of constraints around them. Some of the constraints are the ones that we were, were just mentioned, the constraints of uh, shareholder groups monitoring takeover markets and all that. But the most, the primary constraint are product markets. And product markets are not segmented ideologically. So if a corporation, and I agree disclosure is completely significant, if a, if a, a corporation uh, decides to uh, align itself with a controversial social issue or political party issue, it is going to distance itself from a big part of its product market uh, uh, individuals. This is extremely dangerous in a competitive market. So that when we look at where corporations, for example, make charitable contributions, who do they make charitable contributions to? The, this sort of white bread, non-controversial institutions like uh, educational TV stations, perhaps, or the art museum, or early children's education. They don't want controversy because controversy is going to signal to the product market who it is. And for this reason alone, I don't think you're going to see uh, corporations uh, wanting to involve themselves uh, very much with corporate funds in, in political affairs. Uh, now, that position is, is critically related to the fact that markets have to be able to know what, in fact, corporations are doing. And I think that is essential. I mean, uh, the, the notion of a boycott is a perfectly valid uh, thing and, and it will help keep business corporations uh, working on their business questions, not on their, not on social agenda. Uh, the notion that the, this is a serious agency problem, however, is really, I think, a, a, a silly way to change law. To try and imagine that there's a CEO who is going to leave his CEO job and become a, a congressman and therefore say, well, he could be spending company. I need a lot more in the way of data to change law based upon this notion that this is a spe uh, an agency problem. I don't disagree that if we, we could have a special rule for political speech, the problem is what constitutes political speech. If the rule goes to making uh, expenditures uh, directly or indirectly in favor of a particular campaign, then I don't have a problem with it. My problem with changing the law is uh, and John's going to have a study that gets to lobbying. Uh, lobbying Congress to change the law or lobbying a legislature could be regarded as political by somebody. And lobbying is actually a, a, a very important. I mean, it doesn't cost a huge amount for, for most firms to lobby. Uh, but it's very important for business firms to be effective. If, if a new regulation on clean air is going to come out and it's going to raise the cost of production a great deal, it's the responsibility of the firm to be there to inform the process, at least about the effects this is going to have, and maybe to share the uh, technological information it has about different ways to regulate. So we need to have the producers in our economy 
sharing information with the regulators. And if we uh, make more difficult or impede in any way that lobbying process, we're creating a, a public policy problem for ourselves. Now, I know K Street is not a very popular thing in the American imagination, and not with me either, but the fact is that lobbying is an important, vital public function. And if in our regulation of political speech, we somehow get to regulate or impede a uh, company's lobbying activities, I think we've done ourselves a disservice. Uh, the third point I would make is, uh, I can conclude really, because I made my first point, which was the only point worth hearing. Uh, <laughs> I, I could give you, uh, I disagree a little bit with some of the things that are in, in some, these are the two papers that are out on this subject. <coughs> I think what is important not, is to look at these problems not as legal problems, but as social problems. That is, to evaluate changes in the law in the context of the real markets within which firms operate. And uh, when we look at, uh, for example, the law, uh, whether shareholders can enact a bylaw that says no political contributions, I think what we really have to look at is if shareholders adopted even a precatory resolution that said, uh, don't make any uh, direct contributions to political campaigns, narrowly stated. I think boards in, in this environment, boards of directors would uh, adopt it. There, there really isn't any leverage on the other side of that issue. If the institutional investors get behind a prohibition of direct contribution, it'll happen. I mean, uh, staggered boards, which are much more vital to, to corporations, uh, than making political contributions uh, are, are going uh, the way of the horse and buggy because institutional shareholders are insisting on it. So I don't think we have to look at the technical corporation law very much to know that, that if the shareholders don't want direct political expenditures, they, they can get it. Uh, so I'll, I'll conclude my remarks with that. Well, my thought about product markets being important here is hinged upon some disclosure. I mean, I think it's, it's essential that there be reasonable disclosure of, uh, of a direct or indirect political spending. And I also think it's essential that we don't trample on lobbying in the process of regulating. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, professor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, professor Coates. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here as well, um, to be able to talk to this issue. Like the others on the panel, I also am a total neophyte in the election law area and even constitutional law, which I, in theory, was taught at NYU Law School some time ago, but I've forgotten large chunks of it, sorry, um, to confess. Um, but I did go back and look at it in the wake of Citizens United, and I think actually the one, I've said this joke to some of you, the, the one good thing to come out of the decision is suddenly everybody on the business side of law schools and in business schools, people who have not thought carefully about election law uh, or the relationship between election law and First Amendment jurisprudence suddenly are interested in it for the first time because it is going to, I think, contrary to Bill's intuition, I, my intuition is different. I think over time, uh, as was suggested at the outset of the day, that the ability to get directly involved in elections um, is going to be too great a temptation. In fact, it's going to be a, a necessity in, in some instances for corporations to be able to continue doing what they, in principle, want to do, which is to serve uh, consumers and their shareholders um, in, in, a, in a sensible way. A and then once they're in that environment, then much more serious problems can come about of the kind that has already been alluded to today, corruption at the, at the most extreme. Um, I want to make first a couple observations, just to make sure everybody heard it. You know, Bill and Robert are in total agreement <laughs> that disclosure of corporate political activity would be an important legal reform. And I just, I think it's important that whatever other disagreements we might have about the facts, I'm also in agreement with that. Um, it's something that still isn't the law and doesn't look likely to be the law generally for public companies anytime soon. And that's a sad statement, frankly, about our democracy. Um, and so if nothing else, I hope we can all walk away with at least that commitment to, to the outcome. Um, the second thing I want to uh, note, um, and this is just a very general point, but I think it's really important to keep in mind, 
all of the studies that have been done of corporate political activity uh, for many years, met by many people in business schools, have uh, long predated interest in this topic, um, are consistent that different kinds of political activity are complements. So lobbying, I completely agree with Bill, serves very important purposes, a good purpose in many respects, to make sure that legislators are informed about the effects of potential reform, legal change, rule change on uh, various industries and ultimately on consumers and shareholders. So I, I, I'm completely in favor of the idea that, that in that area there ought to be uh, free and open speech. But lobbying becomes far more powerful when it's accompanied by the ability of the person paying the lobbyist to directly threaten a particular legislator's re-election chances. And so in general, across lots of studies over many decades, the companies that are most active in lobbying also are most likely to have set up a corporate PAC. Back when soft dollars were pitted, permitted, were most likely to uh, use soft dollars to influence election campaigns. And in my estimation, over the next many years, if nothing changes, um, they will be the most likely to get involved directly in election expenditures, uh, or uh, if there's a risk of a boycott, to do it without disclosure through laundered conduits. So. We don't really, uh, it, 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 in a minute I'm going to present some data on lobbying, but I don't, I don't want the takeaway to be, as Bill suggested, that lobbying somehow directly should be forbidden. Um, but I do think it's important to bear in mind that if and to the extent you think that lobbying can sometimes play a bad role, which many people do, Bill sort of alluded to this too, um, K Street, why has K Street got this double-edged quality to it? Because sometimes, of course, lobbyists are not simply about informing the lawmakers, but rather influencing the lawmakers, uh, not simply about making sure they're informed about outcomes, but in fact extracting rents, transferring money from taxpayers to corporations. And so lobbying on its own, while it, it has pluses and minuses, when it's coupled with other kinds of political activity, becomes much more dangerous. And that's why I think it's more important to think about responses to the other more direct kinds of political activity than it would be in some uh, other universe. Um, all right, so let me give you the punchline of uh, empirical work that I've been doing. Um, I'm going to put up this one first. Within the shareholder um, corporate governance community outside of election law, that's been going on for decades now, uh, Bill, Rob, and others, Jennifer and others have been engaged in lots of debates over how much shareholder power in publicly held corporations uh, would be a good thing. And you can have endless debates over, and we have had endless debates over where, to, where, where, this, where we should be on the spectrum. Um, I come from a background, I uh, used to work at the law firm that Bill's still associated with at Wachtell, which traditionally views managerial authority as a good thing, and shareholder power often can be quite pernicious. So my priors on all this are not that shareholder, more shareholder power is necessarily better. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Rob's co-author at, at, uh, uh, on his uh, 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 Citizens United article, Lucian Bebchuk, has taken the opposite view. He's very much a pro-shareholder person. And one of the important pieces of evidence in that debate that we managerialists um, in the corporate governance world have had to confront, which I don't think we have a good answer for still to this day, is this up on the board, which is that uh, G here is a measure of shareholder power. And the more shareholder power there is in a publicly held company, uh, the basically the better uh, the, the corporation does uh, the, the, for reasons perverse, the, whoever came up with this measure did it reverse so that more shareholder power is a lower number, so that's why the sign is negative. Um, but basically, uh, basically, however measured, uh, and, and the, the standard measure here is relationship of the stock price to the asset value of the company, how effective the managers are in using corporate assets. They do a better job when shareholders have more power. And that's a robust finding that's been replicated by many, many different people uh, over time. Now, there are lots of debates you can have about whether there's anything we can do to existing corporate structures to actually improve that value. It may be that we've already gotten to the right place for most companies and there's not much more we can do with that, but that's just a robust finding that was out there already. So to that, I want to add um, uh, contributions, uh, political contributions through PACs uh, and lobbying. Um, these two things uh, strongly are correlated with shareholder power in the reverse way, which is to say, the more shareholder power, 
the less likely in the past 15 years, pre-Citizens United, the publicly held company was to get involved in political activity of any kind, whether lobbying or uh, setting up PACs. Um, for some companies, it seems to me clear that lobbying is so important, Boeing can't do the job for their shareholders without engaging in lobbying um, of some kind, however you want to define lobbying. Um, so I don't think, again, to reiterate, a ban on Boeing telling, you know, putting in bids and then trying to get the contract for their shareholders would be a bad, would be a good thing for their shareholders. But in general, and this is the real punchline, in general, on average, for most public companies, those that do get involved in political activity, whether PAC contributions or lobbying, this is all pre-Citizens United, the worse their shareholders do. The, the lower the value the, the market places on the companies with the same industry, with the same assets, all controlling for every factor that you can control for. Um, and so the punchline is, even before Citizens United, even with relatively benign, in, in many respects, ways that corporations could get involved in the political sphere through setting up PACs and through lobbying, uh, the companies that tended to do it, tended to do it, I think, uh, the data is most consistent with Rob's story, which is to say they did it uh, on average in ways that tended to favor managerial interest uh, and harm shareholder interests, not, in fact, maximize the best value of the corporation. And this is consistent with you know, Adam Smith's observation 250 years ago that companies with dispersed shareholders have a hard time controlling managers. It's just a basic common sense point. Um, and I think it's borne out in the political sphere as well. Um, now, and just to give you the real you know, picture here, this is true across the board. So if you just take measures of shareholder rights, which other people have come up with, I didn't invent these, Take shareholder dispersion, how many shareholders there are, you get the same results. Um, the more powerful the shareholders, the less political activity on the left, the weaker they are, the more political activity. And go back to the original point, the second point I made, which is that political activity is a complement. Citizens United now means we've got a whole new avenue to reinforce the power that corporations have had already through lobbying and through PAC activity to expand the influence of those two others and to have an additional weapon. And so I, I think this is only going to get worse over time. I think that shareholders are going to find themselves more and more frequently in conflict with management over this. I think well-considered, thoughtful managers don't like this. They, don't, they, weren't, they didn't go to business school in order to play dirty politics. They went to business school in order to sell cupcakes or whatever they, they sell. Um, to make people happy with Starbucks coffee and Coca-Cola and all the other products that we all take for granted. They didn't go there in order to fight on K Street in order to extract rent from the taxpayer. So I think most CEOs who are sitting at large public companies today, I hope, exactly as Bill suggests, will be receptive to the predictable wave of shareholder activism that's going to come. Um, and my study will, you know, have a tiny effect on this, but it's going to happen anyway. Because in fact, institutional shareholders, for good reasons, and this data supports it, shouldn't have their corporations actively involved in politics. Lobbying is a different story. I have no problem with lobbying, and I don't think as a general matter the shareholder proposals ought to directly attack lobbying. But just remember, if you control political activity through PACs and or now through independent expenditures, you're going to make whatever influence you can get through lobbying more likely to be the public regarding kind of providing information rather than simply influence. And so I'll stop there with one last thing I'll say about product markets. Um, it, one, Bill's point is right um, for Target and for Home Depot and for consumer companies. But I want to remind everybody that most of the corporate money in the country isn't in a consumer market. It's in a prior market. It's in a, 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 a upstream market in which consumer pressures and boycotts either are impossible to organize, unlikely to organize, and therefore I don't think the product market constraint is quite as broad in general as, as Bill suggested. But I'll, that's my only disagreement with his otherwise sensible as usual remarks. Thank you. Professor Taub. So thank you. Um, I'm honored to be here 
also, and to learn today that I am a world expert in corporate and securities law. Uh, my mother will be honored, something she probably always knew. Um, so my starting point is not the role shareholders should play uh, regarding corporate political spending, but uh, the role they are currently playing, uh, the role they might play in the future, and what the implications of that uh, will be. So the starting point is two observations um, regarding uh, the present and the future. Presently, shareholders, uh, since roughly 2004, have been participating in the process of uh, initiating uh, re resolutions to be voted on at annual meetings, thanks to the Center for Political Accountability, and voting on those. Um, I'm going to call these, uh, in my talk today, uh, show me resolutions, because these resolutions are asking corporations to disclose how much they're spending on certain political activities, who's receiving the money, and who inside of the firm is making those decisions. Um, these, uh, and my focus will be on the 2010 resolutions at 28 firms. Um, and these show me resolutions are non-binding. Um, so this is already happening. The second observation is that there may be a shift of decision-making authority um, concerning corporate political spending from managers and directors to shareholders, in particular institutional shareholders, through something like a Shareholder Protection Act requirement um, where, uh, if passed, would require um, a majority of outstanding shareholders to sanction a political spending, perhaps over a threshold amount. And I want to draw your attention to one thing. These uh, types of uh, requirements have very, are, are different in terms of the denominators here. So with the show me resolutions, in order for one of them to pass, uh, the shareholders only need to receive uh, a majority of the votes cast for and the votes cast against. But if we were looking at a Shareholder Protection Act, Act type requirement, a majority plus one of, of the outstanding shares would, would be needed. So the research questions that arise from these observations um, are three. First is, can we look at the voting records, uh, uh, the most recent and the most successful shareholder resolutions, um, the show me resolutions, to predict how a consent type resolution um, might, might uh, bear out? Secondly, um, are there gaps in disclosure? We've talked about disclosure. Um, I'm talking about disclosure in the other direction, um, not the disclosure piece of what, where the money the corporation is committing is going, but disclosure down the intermediation chain um, in that uh, the, uh, over 70 percent of the top 1,000 firms in the U.S. are uh, the firms themselves share, 70 percent of the shares in those firms are owned by institutional investors that are largely holding those shares on behalf of underlying beneficiaries. Um, is it easy for those folks, people who own mutual funds, for example, directly, or uh, folks who are uh, participants in a 401k plan, can they uh, find out uh, whether some of the, the money that they have at risk uh, is being uh, dedicated to particular political campaigns, even given the existing disclosure regimes where mutual funds and certain investment advisors have to disclose, isn't even enough for those shareholders, and it doesn't cover the full landscape. And then finally, are there gaps in consent, even given a Shareholder Protection Act model, um, in that uh, if 70 percent of these firms are institutional shareholders who are largely voting, we have the 30 percent of the true human beings uh, for whom one would think the First Amendment right is mostly, you know, mo mostly attaches, uh, who don't largely vote. Um, should there be something additional, such as a requirement that a majority of those real human beings who invest directly in, in companies also have to approve such expenditures? So um, this next slide is a drawing of, um, of actually how firms are organized. It's meant to challenge uh, footnote 7 in, in the Scalia's concurrence where he says the following. The authorized spokesman of a corporation is a human being who speaks on behalf of the human beings who have formed that association just as the spokesman of an unincorporated association speaks on behalf of its members. Um, so I'm not sure if it shows up here, but I try to highlight the human beings in yellow. And so we have the corporate manager or director. He is the human being making the spending decisions. And then if you look at the configuration of ownership, 70 percent of owners are institutions. You can't find the human beings until you go farther down the um, intermediation chain. And then we have these other individual owners who are, who are humans. Um, 
If we go farther down the intermediation chain, one example of an institutional investor are mutual funds who hold about 24 percent of U.S. equities. And then you can also see we have some real human beings who hold mutual funds. Um, and then we go to the 401K or the D, uh, other D.C. plans, and you get to the plan participants. Um, none of these human beings obviously cast any votes or, or have a say um, in political spending under a proposed shareholder protection act consent regime. And even today, uh, with whatever disclosure that is happening um, in, in terms of a voluntary basis by those firms who are adopting better disclosure standards or who, or who might under um, a, a shareholder resolution, these folks have a very difficult time understanding uh, where their money is going. Okay, so. Um, on these slides, what I tried to look at is uh, the 8Ks for voting at 27 of the 28 firms that had uh, show me votes. I dropped out Ford because of its unique um, ownership structure. And what you see here in the, that, that first left column is uh, the number of shares outstanding and then half of that. So in a Shareholder Protection Act regime, that would be a, the amount of votes that one would need to, to um, if a manager had a proposal for how much money should be spent on uh, political contributions, uh, to get that passed, managers would need that green bar uh, right there. In contrast, if you look at the, I think it's the third bar over where you see the total fours and against votes cast at, at all state, in order to have, if they wanted to get that passed, they would only have needed about half. So you can see that it's a different number. And um, this is representative of the others. This is the average of the, all the show me resolutions combined. And what this shows you is that it was, it was a high number at Allstate, uh, received 40 percent of the vote. And then this is uh, the average uh, for all the 1488s at those 27 firms, on average 30 percent. Okay, so this is the, I guess, the important uh, pie chart. If I'm trying to predict, looking at the shareholder votes, what a, um, from the show me resolutions, what a consent or a sanctioning resolution, how it would play out, we have to make some guesses, and I'm realizing that these, okay, we've got to make some, some guesses as to how folks voted on, show me how you're spending the money, might vote on, go ahead and spend the money. So I'm making the assumption for the purpose of this talk that the folks who said, don't show me, I don't want to see how you're spending the money, are likely to be pro-management and just say, if that's how you want to spend it, go ahead. Just an assumption I'm making here. What you can see then is that that's not enough if you looked at, if you imagine the same configuration of voters, which we wouldn't necessarily have, but just with this configuration of voters, the folks who said don't show me would not be enough to be able to sanction management's proposals. One would need another uh, number of voters, and it turns out that those who abstained, which is about 12 percent, if you had all of those folks who abstained um, and didn't decided to be present but vote abstain, not safely if they're for or against, I guess you can call them the swing voters, you need all of those to pass a resolution. Now, of course, there are some shareholders who said, I do want to see uh, you know, I do want to see how spending, uh, what the spending is. They may decide to still approve. But in the, in the, if you want to be, the, I guess, the most conservative looking at this, um, you could say it's very close here. So what do we look at all, uh, all 27 firms, and it's sort of the same, the same configuration. Um, based on this, you know, I would predict that these proposals would pass then. Because I do think, having spoken with some institutional investors who are very interested in knowing where the money is going, I'm not sure that they would necessarily feel comfortable saying no to the expenditures. Okay, so what are the conclusions? The conclusions are that it's possible that uh, spending decisions may shift from managers uh, and directors to institutional owners, and also that the interests of institutional owners, uh, money managers, might diverge from those of, the, of ultimate investors. This is sort of a missing piece today of the argument. Um, some of the work I've done before is about uh, mutual fund proxy voting. Um, and how there may be conflicts of interest that encourage them to favor management's position over their underlying shareholders. Um, and then the third conclusion is that assuming that we end up with a Shareholder Protection Act type requirement, um, that in addition to supplement that, I think better disclosure of institutional owners' votes would be necessary. So this is akin to what Robert was saying. Under the Dodd-Frank Act, there is now this requirement that um, votes on executive pay uh, are disclosed. Um, and the disclosure expands to 13 F, all 13 F filers, which is institutional owners, beyond what um, right now is required of uh, proxy votes. Also, I think the, the format of the disclosure is really difficult to work with. 
I think institutional investors um, should have to roll up their voting up to their parent entity. For many people, they choose a fund family, whether it's Vanguard or Fidelity or whomever, um, and they want to know how they're voting, and they won't necessarily be able to use the data at the SEC's website and figure out the name of the trust of the mutual fund they're um, investing in. And I think this should go all the way down the intermediation chain. And then finally, I think it makes sense to consider, maybe this is the most radical of the proposal, but to consider that the real human beings who are direct owners and corporations should have to uh, express 50% plus one approval of voting. Um, one last thing I want to say um, that, I, they, that I left out, uh, who are those? Who are the uh, the, vote, the the folks who vote abstain? That 12 percent I showed you. It turns out that there are a few large fund families that, um, if you look at the all-state vote, half of the abstain. So six percent of the outstanding shares, um, three fund firms are voting abstain. And so voting abstain is considered good in the realm of the Show Me resolutions because by dropping out of moving from an against vote to abstain, you've increased the power of the four vote. So that's good in that realm. In this other realm, though, it's not necess it's, it's, it makes it very, very difficult to predict where they, where they would vote. And it also gives them sort of swing voting power as these undecided who now uh, have a certain kind of authority. So it's, again, very important that in, 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 all, uh, in all state, I think the three firms, well, I don't want to name names right now, but if you were to, uh, a mutual fund owner, I think you would want to know if your fund firm was making that deciding vote as to on political spending. So thank you very much. Um, thank you. <laughs> so now we have time for questions, and I'm going to take the uh, moderator's prerogative and ask the first question to the panel. Um, I am wondering, when it comes to corporate political expenditures, do we have to rethink the idea of materiality? And here's my example. Famously, last summer, uh, Target spent $150,000 in the Minnesota governor's race. And from a securities laws point of view, the expenditure of $150,000 would not be deemed material. But Target got boycotted, got picketed. They are actually still being picketed in California, and we know that because there was just a recent court decision allowing the picketers to keep picketing. Um, and they're, they're still losing business deals, most notably from Lady Gaga. Um, <laughs> so do we need a different conception of materiality when it comes to political spending? The, the target situation you're probably all familiar with was a mistake. Uh, and corporations will make mistakes. People make mistakes. If they had any idea that, uh, that this candidate, well, the, the CEO of Target, I think, said, you know, he, he was focusing on the tax uh, a platform of this candidate that they gave money to. Uh, but that candidate also had a position on, on gay marriage, I think, was yes. the issue. And he says he didn't know. Uh, if he did know, he made a stupid mistake, and they're paying a very high price. Uh, I don't think I would, I don't want to change the law based upon imagined things. You know, think of one, uh, this target guy makes a mistake, gets into a big trouble, he did something deplorable, and so we change the law. I, I'm not in favor of that. Uh, the only way I would change the law is not on SEC disclosure. I would urge institutional investors to get behind a frank prohibition of direct contribution to political candidates or expenditures in support of political candidates. Keep it simple. You will convince the institutions of doing it because there's no real justifiable business uh, interest in doing it systematically. And boards will find it very difficult to resist it. Uh, that, to me, is a simple program of reform that gets really what I think most people want, which is to keep of them out of electoral politics. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> first I want to emphasize a point of agreement uh, between, um, between Bill and I, which is that I'm loath to make uh, law around this example. I, I think for reasons that John gave, this, is, uh, this example strikes me as the exception, not the rule. This is, an exception, this is an example where the corporation engaged in some political spending and it immediately became subject to a great deal of public attention. And as John pointed out, this is an area where I, like Bill, am optimistic that maybe product markets or other types of market discipline do some work. And in fact, the fact that there are still protests suggests to me that it's doing some work. 
Uh, and my guess is that the board of Target Corporation is paying a lot more attention to political expenditures today than they were a year ago. So I wouldn't make law around, around this exception. But I guess I want to add something around the, where the law stands today, because we've talked a lot about um, the importance of shareholders being able to talk to their companies. And uh, the paper just presented provides some evidence that shareholders are bringing these kinds of resolutions. And I guess the point I want to make is that as it stands under SEC rules and Delaware law, it is exceedingly difficult for shareholders to pass a bylaw or to uh, enact a shareholder resolution that actually binds the board of directors with respect to these matters. So as the law stands at this moment, uh, doing the kinds of things where I'm at, I mean, to me, I'm glad to hear there's agreement on the panel about disclosure and, and that this is an important step forward in terms, of, uh, in terms of helping markets to do their work. But I just want to emphasize that where the law is today is that there is very little disclosure and that for shareholders to bind boards of directors in this respect is exceedingly difficult, if not impossible, under most legal regimes. So I, I actually want to be a, a more reformist than Rob here um, uh, on, on disclosure, because I do think, for reasons that, that you made very well earlier, that political decisions by corporations are different in kind from uh, other kinds of decisions. And while they bleed into business strategy in industries that are dependent on government or that are heavily regulated, that's not actually the majority of the economy. And I would suggest that even for companies in those industries, modest levels of disclosure through an SEC rather than an FEC regime would be good for those companies. I think it would be good for the company's shareholders and would be good for the managers in the long run. And so um, it's not that I think we ought to change the rule because of the target anecdote. I think for a long time. It would have been better, and it would be better in the future, if the SEC understood materiality, that's the code word we use in securities law for what's important, to understand what's important to shareholders in some contexts is different than in others. It's not that the particular amount of money to be spent in politics needs to be that big for there nevertheless to be a worry, for reasons that Rob made earlier, that political contributions will be uh, uh, more or less ways of uh, managers uh, pursuing their own private ends. And there are plenty of examples drawn from charitable contributions. My favorite example is the Occidental Petroleum example, which came up to the Delaware courts, where the CEO basically donated a lot of money to create a museum, not of the kind Bill suggested earlier, a, a, a sort of mainstream uh, art museum, but basically to put his own private art collection in and then to have it basically be his own. And all of this was funded by corporate shareholder money. And so both in the charitable area and the political area, I think there are obvious reasons to think that CEOs will be tempted often, not good ones, you know, but some of them, enough of them, uh, to, mandate, to, to justify a modest mandate of disclosure in, in these areas. Professor Tom? <laughs> OK, so um, I'm just sort of putting my uh, institutional ownership lens and intermediation lens on this, thinking that if you look through uh, to a very diversified uh, uh, investor who may own a variety of um, you know, investments that are managed by intermediaries. They might be surprised uh, to find that they're supporting candidates yeah. on opposite sides. Um, and so the, the trouble with materiality um, is that might not be exactly what's important because you know, to a you know, small, well-diversified shareholder, we're talking about not very much money, but it's really the principle of participating in a system where they're, on, they're actually ratcheting up spending and finding out that their, uh, their investments are kind of canceling each other out. So I, I, I'm just in, I'm in favor uh, to err on, on the side of disclosure and, and let the investors decide if, it, if it's sensible. I just add one small point, sure. which is that um, you asked whether it's time to redefine materiality, this important standard. And one thing I'd say about this is it wouldn't actually require the SEC to go so far afield from things they've already done to consider an expenditure like the one we're talking about to be uh, disclosable. For example, the SEC already has uh, what's called related party transaction disclosure, uh, which involves disclosure of transactions between people in the corporation who are interested in the other side of the transaction. And the threshold for this is $120,000. So this is less than the $150,000 that Target was spending. So it wouldn't be totally crazy as a matter of corporate or securities law to lower the materiality threshold to address these matters as, as John suggests we should. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kanzer, a yeah, question. Thank you. 
Yeah, and the SEC has done that with environmental fines as well. Yeah. So, uh, quick, I think quick observation on the target situation since it just come up and I've not something I want. I was going to talk about, and then a more general observation on the target situation. I would say that the mistake the target made was contributing to an organization that was required to disclose its contributors. <laughs> um, uh, the Center for Political Accountability's research has demonstrated over the course five or six years that it's a common everyday occurrence for companies to make highly controversial uh, political contributions. The information is not widely known. Consumers don't often get it. I think what happened with Target is because that there is a concerted effort to think about this stuff now after Citizens United. And I think it's going to happen more and more. I think it's going to be more and more common. And I would suspect the Target's net contributions will be to different types of organizations that are a little bit quieter. Um, the general observation I wanted to make when we talk about uh, shareholder interests here is I think it's important to recognize that there are at least two different sets of shareholder interests. There's the sort of traditional shareholder interest, which I think the, you know, Justice Kennedy referred to, which is their interest in ensuring that the corporation is making money for shareholders, uh, that the contributions that, sharehold, that, the, that the company makes are in the best interests of the company and the best interests of shareholders. Uh, a voting mechanism might be an appropriate way to do that. I still have lots of concerns about it, but it may be an appropriate way of, of uh, addressing that interest. Shareholders also, however, have a First Amendment interest, and that interest is to ensure that they're not underwriting speech that they disagree with, uh, or they find objectionable, or maybe they don't want to speak at all in a, in a political, political forum. In my view, the First Amendment rights of shareholders unless you're considering a closely held corporation, cannot be addressed uh, if you permit large publicly traded corporations to make these kinds of contributions. And the primary reason for that is for all the reasons that Jennifer outlined, it basically the structure of the proxy voting system, and one point that was not made, is that it is a one share, one vote system. It's not a one person, one vote system. And the one share, one vote, doesn't even relate to the amount of money that you have invested. Uh, investors in our mutual fund may have invested a million dollars. We may only hold 10,000 shares in a particular corporation. You know, that's our call. So when we vote on their behalf, we're not vot voting their million dollars. We're voting however many shares we decided to buy. Uh, and as fiduciaries, we must set aside their political interests, even if we knew what they were, which we can't. So we have to vote in the common interests of the fund. Uh, now, we take a very broad view of that, but still, we're not going to go poll our shareholders and find out who they want elected in Minnesota. Uh, that just would be totally inappropriate as a fiduciary. So there's no way to vindicate that. Uh, we just uh, filed as, as lead amicus in a, um, uh, a brief to defend uh, the state of Montana's uh, campaign finance law. Uh, the uh, Carl Sandstrom at the firm of Perkins Coie filed on our behalf, uh, I think, today, uh, and be happy to share more information about that. We'll be putting out some information probably next week or in the coming weeks about that. But we're really making that argument that this is a, this is a, a regime of compelled speech, uh, and compelled speech is, uh, uh, violates the First Amendment. So I'm just curious if anybody has comments on, on, on that structure and the First Amendment rights of shareholders. Well, from a traditional uh, corporation law point of view, and it, uh, as I said, I'm not an expert in constitutional law, so it may be that you can make a constitutional argument that shareholders have a First Amendment right with respect to things that their agents are, are saying. But as a corporation law point of view, that's not correct. Uh, the, the shareholders don't have, for example, a property right in the property owned by the corporation. The corporation does. What shareholders have are certain governance rights, rights to elect, rights in the event of a dissolution, to, and so forth. Uh, so we don't, at least traditional corporation law, looks upon the corporation as an entity and the shareholders not as its owners, although we speak that way often, uh, but as interest holders that have certain rights. So there may be a, a federal case out there that says this, but under corporation law, I don't think it would. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Under corporate law, they're wrong, but <laughs> what can you do? I think the one thing we can agree on is the Supreme Court was not well informed about corporate law. Um, I, the, the only other thing I would say on this, I, I actually think this is a hard problem. I'm not sure that I know the, the, whether uh, 
what the answer is. Right? Because you, you, you can think of newspaper companies, you can think of Google, you can think of lots of situations where, in fact, corporations are speaking, and they're speaking in ways that the shareholders might violently disagree with, but it's not clear to me that that should be viewed proper, appropriately as compelled speech by the, the shareholders. I will say, just as a matter of parity, however, um, that the unions in the country do have to live with a stricter rule, which in, you know, basically in no-shop states, they, they, they have to give their members an opt-out on all political activity, and that there's at least a, a good debate we could have about whether another type of reform to add to the ones that's already been presented here would be not only presenting the budget to the shareholders and having them vote on it, but then giving them all an opt-out and basically forbidding the company to spend any more than those who don't opt-out permit them to spend. And that would be another way to get at this kind of a problem. You know, it, I, I only throw it out there just as a thought, you know, thought idea because the odds that the Congress will pass anything like that in the next century seem to me very low. <laughs> um, uh, so I go back to disclosure, and I do agree with Bill that here there's a lot of room for, for self-help with appropriate disclosure in place. Okay. Um, Ms. Gilbert. Thanks. Uh, this is for Professor Taub, uh, per, or perhaps more broadly, from the position of those of us who are advocating right now for the Shareholder Protection Act in D.C. and similar pieces of state legislation. Uh, one thing that we have to tackle pretty consistently is making the case that the Shareholder Protection Act is constitutional and practical. It's not tantamount to a ban for corporate interests. Uh, so I'm interested in your idea of having a percentage of real persons or retail investors um, actually take an additional vote and just practically how that would work if it's doable, you know, obviously we can still change the legislation. Okay, so um, what's nice about being an academic um, is that you can have ideas that people will come listen to. I have not run this by a you know, constitutional law scholar, obviously, and I, I've read the Citizens United opinion. I, I don't know the answer to that. I'd be curious um, what someone who's an expert in constitutional law would say about, about that idea. So, uh, you know, we all, we've all disclaimed expertise <laughs> in constitutional law, which is... <laughs> Go for it. But I really mean it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I want to be careful. But, but when, we, uh, when we thought about a few, um, a few of these proposals, we did talk with constitutional law scholars, and I, I just want to make a couple of points about it. First of all, I think the idea of a, of a majority of the human's condition um, is a fascinating idea and uh, deserves, a, deserves some attention. It's, it's uh, sort of tricky. Um, I think it would be tricky implementation. I'm sure you thought a little bit about that. But, but what I want to say about the constitutional law question is that most of the constitutional law scholars I've spoken to about this feel relatively comfortable that so long as, um, so long as the, 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 line between, the, the lines defining the political speaking are clearly drawn and drawn consistently with previous Supreme Court precedents, a Shareholder Protection Act-like statute would, would very likely survive. And the reason that they give is that in this area in general, uh, the Supreme Court has been particularly deferential to federal securities rules that, uh, that would traditionally raise serious problems under speech type analysis. So Fred Schauer at Harvard has a piece from 2004 where he talks about this in the Harvard Law Review. And he explains that you think of all kinds of securities rules we've got that compel speech, for example, that require things to be disclosed at certain times, that require companies to say things that they might prefer not to say, that they frequently prefer not to say. And the analysis of these rules in the Supreme Court has been, has been relatively deferential. It's been different as a matter of First Amendment analysis. Now, of course, at the end of the day, you know, the answer to your question, I think, you just have to ask Justice Kennedy. But, um, but I just wanted to point you to, those, point you to that article uh, in those cases, because most, most, most of the folks I've consulted have pointed to that shower uh, article and have, have come to the conclusion that the, 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 the statute would likely survive. Okay. Mrs. Lerner. Hi, I'm Susan Lerner from Common Cause New York, and I can't resist bragging a little bit that it was Common Cause Minnesota, uh, which revealed the target donations. <laughs> um, there's a lot to unpack <laughs> in, on, in this panel. Um, I'd like, and one of the advantages of being an advocate and not a law professor is that we get to challenge law professors <laughs> with our experience in the real world. Excellent. Um, I'd like to commend to everybody, if you haven't looked at it already, an article with a very illuminating chart which appeared in the LA Times, I believe last week, that looks at the corporate political disclosures of, uh, I think it was the 50 largest uh, publicly traded corporations, and less than 20% fully disclosed. So um, we're talking <clears throat> in an interesting theoretical sense um, but in the real world, what's happening is that there is a disparity. 
uh, between what I think ordinary people expect and how the corporations actually behave. Uh, and I've had some very illuminating discussions with uh, corporate um, officials and business association heads who have said they absolutely oppose disclosure because the marketplace will respond. Um, and therefore, they don't <laughs> want people to know. And that's why we get the layers of uh, different organizations which are uh, conduits for political spending. So one question that I have um, for Professor uh, Johnson is when you talk about the existing forms of corporate oversight and the special corporate oversight uh, that is given to compensation, for instance, I ask you, is this really your strongest example? Because I think currently there is a sense among the general public and a sense among the press and perhaps also in shareholders that we have a great um, disparity between corporate compensation and the actual performance in the long term of uh, a corporation where we have seen article after article that shows that uh, corporate management is receiving large bonuses and extremely high corpor uh, corporate compensation when the corporation itself may actually be tanking. Um, and I have a question for Chancellor Allen about lobbying. In about two weeks, Common Cause New York is going to release a report where we analyze the grassroots lobbying expenditures here in New York State, um, a phenomenon which we are seeing in increasing amounts here in New York, which we've seen uh, in other states, and that is a distinction between the two different types of lobbying. You seem to be talking about direct lobbying. Um, I think we can debate whether it's uh, a good thing that we now have $210 million spent on lobbying in New York where we have an extraordinary number of uh, something like 16 lobbyists for every legislator. The figure, if anything, is similar or higher in Congress. But putting that aside, we are now seeing, at least at the state level, an increasing use of exactly the same techniques which are used for electioneering being used for lobbying, with the object of the lobbying not being the legislators directly, not being, we'll sit down and talk to you and make our case for why we think industry does or doesn't want to see this kind of regulation, but rather the kind of advertising we saw here in New York, which is very broad and is about, for instance, the public should or should not support the governor's budget as a whole. Um, and I would suggest to you that we've got a difference in lobbying, um, in this kind of lobbying, where it's tipping over into political money. The techniques are the same, and that we should be looking at the same kind of disclosures and perhaps some way in which it should be treated differently. My last comment is when we talk about corporate law, we get into the details. Shouldn't we also be talking about the role of corporations in our society in general? Uh, there has been a shift. If you look at how the Business Council uh, defines its mission, it changed, I believe, in the mid-70s to strip out all mention of the role of corporations and sh stakeholders other than shareholders, and now concentrates only on shareholders as stakeholders to corporate action. I would suggest that that is something we as a society should be talking about because it's not immutable. It is within our control. Corporations are artificial constructs that have only the rights we give to them, and we need to be more proactive in defining who they are and how they behave. So those are my two areas of questions. Okay, um, go ahead. Should I? Should I? Well, <laughs> <laughs> you, you have expanded somewhat the, uh, the question. I mean, the last point you bring up were really, I mean, you, you, I've been to two and three day conferences on, <laughs> on, on this uh, subject. And I can't, I can't really say anything intelligent, because I haven't thought about it, ab about the question of corporations expending corporate funds to affect uh, political issues. Now, I, I saw some, I didn't know if they were corporate TV ads or labor union TV ads. I, I kind of thought they were teacher unions ads. But uh, uh, in any case, this is unlikely, I think, to be an agency problem. That is, from the internal corporate 
law perspective, there, uh, people tend to be concerned about agency problems. Uh, this is probably uh, an indication of doing something that the shareholders might like. Uh, so it's not a corporate law issue per se. The bigger question, what is the role of the corporation in society and the social role and all that, and who should they re be responsible for? We can't, if you talk about it, you won't do any good. Because what has happened is it's not our conception of the corporation, it's the fact that capital markets have grown much bigger and much more powerful. Corporate directors would like to say, we're responsible to everybody. We have an interest in our cons customers and our shareholders, et cetera, because that in effect means no one interest group has a power over them. They're always balancing. Uh, and, and for 50 years, they, they tried to get away with that. Uh, they couldn't do it. Ideas changed, but more importantly, the capital market changed. And now there are very powerful capital market actors, the institutional investors we talked about, and the agents of the institution that, that hold them much more accountable than they did. So we can talk about social responsibility, but to the extent the markets are competitive and the capital market is competitive, uh, we're, we're talking to ourselves. Uh, so that's not very responsive, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Jackson. Uh, yeah, so you, you asked whether uh, executive pay is my best example, um, given that we've been less than completely successful from some points of view uh, in regulating executive compensation. I think what I'd say about this, I, th I think it's a good example, not because of the outcome, but because of the process. So let me tell you why I think it's, it's an interesting example. I mean, the regulation of executive pay, I mean, it's, it's been debated in corporate law literature for you know, 30, 40 years, and it's got a very, very lengthy history. But it sort of came to the public attention more recently as a consequence of a few high profile quote unquote scandals, query scandals, but they came to the public attention recently as a result of some outsized decisions, some unusual decisions that were uh, revealed by the press or, or by uh, folks like you who are uh, staying on top of corporations and watching their conduct carefully. And then we had a period where shareholders attempted to engage in self-help to deal with this problem. They tried governance, they tried institutional shareholders tried communicating with the corporations, they tried bylaws, we had a whole series of articles about that. And then finally last year we got very significant federal intervention on the question, where the Congress simply said, we're just going to give shareholders a federally mandated right to speak about this and tell corporations what they want. And uh, even having done all that, we're now waiting to see what those reforms will accomplish. And what I'd urge on, I mean, I write about executive compensation a fair amount. I think I'd say we're not nearly finished with seeing, first of all, seeing the results of these regulatory reforms, which will take time, and that's time we should take before we take many further steps. But also, um, we won't be finished for a long time because the work that Bill and others have been talking about that markets must do takes time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it takes time for corporations to internalize these lessons about what is in shareholders' interest and what isn't. Similarly, in this area, I would expect we'd follow a similar course. I mean, everyone on this panel has agreed that um, disclosure is a good idea, but my guess is that you would say that even if we get to disclosure, we wouldn't be nearly finished. So what I'd say is that if we start with a regime where we're at now, which is we have very little intervention and shareholders are attempting self-help, we'll need a federal step and then we'll need further work by folks like you. And I think that's why I think of the example as helpful, not because um, we've had extraordinary success in the regulation of executive compensation yet. Is, does it um, in some way reveal a weakness with our selection of outside directors process? <laughs> that's a very broad question. <laughs> <laughs> um, we could, Are any of us currently on board? So there you go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Professor Talib, you looked like you wanted to add something. Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing, which is I'm not here to defend, you know, shareholder <clears throat> primacy necessarily, or a view, you know, the current Anglo-American view of, of of the corporation, you know, being focused on uh, shareholder primacy as opposed to, let's say, some broader stakeholder theory. Um, but, you know, there are other, just I was thinking about, there's been recent coverage of John Lewis Partnerships in the UK, which is a large retailer, which is an employee-owned organization. I mean, there are other, you know, there are other forms for organizing businesses. Um, I'm interested in, you know, in a variety. This is the one we have now, um, and I'm working with, you know, the constraints of the law as it is now, trying to be inventive about the best way to solve the problems that we have now. Okay, uh, Mr. Limbum. Hi, I'm Lance Limbum. I'm president and CEO of the Nathan Cummings Foundation, and it's a real um, honor to be able to uh, talk to law professors as a foundation executive about the real world. And um, 
we have brought a number of proxy actions, um, not only on uh, governance issues and compensation issues, looking very much forward to uh, the Goldman Sachs resolution that we filed on compensation next week. Um, but uh, to, to talk about the uh, issue of political contributions. And uh, I guess most of my questions are, are really directed at uh, Chancellor Allen. And they really deal with agency uh, questions. First of all, just under corporate law, my, my first question is, is we had a uh, discussion at a shareholders meeting with uh, Mr. Murdoch, chairman of the News Corp, um, who essentially um, um, had made some statements that were quoted in the press that they were making certain political contributions based on his personal relationships and not with the uh, corporation's interests. Um, he subsequently backed away from those statements um, because I'm sure he talked to his lawyers. <laughs> but he also said within that, uh, within that stockholder meeting, and the uh, chair of the audit committee also said that the chair was making those decisions and that the chair, as one of his considerations, thought that those contributions were in the best interests of the country not of the, uh, cor he didn't necessarily say of the corporation. Right. Would you say that passes the uh, business judgment test? I, I would say this is a, a lot will depend upon the judge you get. <laughs> but <laughs> th this, this, sh this should survive a motion to dismiss. I if, the, if the statement is we, did, we spent the money for the public good, some will depend, it, something will depend on how much money. Because, for example, under corporation law, we've got some old cases in which a company gives $10,000 to Princeton University and simply justifies it on the basis that giving money to a university is a good thing for the environment. And this has been upheld as long as these expenditures are reasonable in amount. So if somebody gives half of the uh, balance sheet to a university, that will not be permitted. And under nothing more a precise than unreasonable standard. I don't know how this, okay, if I were the corporate lawyer, I would say don't make political contributions on that basis. They must be justified on the basis that this is good for the corporation. Uh, whether or not you get that enforced in a, in a lawsuit, I'm, I'm not sure, but I would say you should at least survive a motion to dismiss, not get thrown out of court on your ear. Uh, but I, I really think, and I'm just repeating myself, that the institutional investors should begin a, a campaign just to prohibit political action. And I think that you would, all of them, there's no reason not to get behind it. And I don't think boards, I mean, Murdoch's case is special because he's so powerful in that company, but I don't think boards will resist this. And it gets around the, you know, the disclosure and so, I mean, you still have questions about, well, what constitutes a, a direct political expenditure. But I think it's the clear, I mean, in principle, you should win this. And I don't think it should be dependent upon uh, John's study that there, there's some little economic something or, or that we need <laughs> to study. <laughs> you know, he's a self-taught sat statistician and very good. So I can't really understand his study. I tried to read it. Uh, but I, I just think that this should be opposed in principle and in a not complicated way and I don't think people will resist it, really. Well, can, in I, fact, can, can this, I bring you back to the, to yeah, the yeah. real world on that? Because yeah. um, essentially those resolutions have been brought, and either they, they have failed because there's a resistance against disclosure for all the reasons that have been talked about, or they're accepted. And, um, but then the money is given to an intermediary, like the National Association of Manufacturing, and, and, and the fact of the matter is, is that the corporation will actually have a statement they're, that they're for a set of principles or they're for a political uh, stand, whether it's environmental or compensation, or whatever, why they are feeding millions of dollars to um, intermediary organizations to undermine exactly what they're talking about. And the issue is that, that they have a vested interest and not letting that information get public because of the target type situations or because they get caught within that contradiction. But I, I may be mistaken, but I, I don't think that this issue has been in the forefront of the big institutional investors. TIA, Kreft, 
uh, for example. I mean, I think it has to be adopted in a serious way by a big piece of the mar uh, investment market, and people will take it seriously. As long as it's just a, a, you know, a few people making the motion, they'll try to evade it. And the other thing is there's a limit to what you can do. No matter, I mean, I'm saying you should have a prohibition. And you're saying, well, prohibition won't work. Uh, you know, I mean, it has to be tied with some disclosure. But no, I was just asking how you get the prohibition. I wasn't against the prohibition. I no, mean, you I, were saying that the institutional investors have to can get bring together. It, it, ha yeah. it has to be a framework. But I mean, there are a number of large institutional investors of which we've been parts of those groups. These are not insignificant investors. They're like Calpers, Galsters, New, the New York pension funds, et cetera, that bring these issues. What I'm talking about is the practical impediments that we, we're. Uh, faced with. The issue is, as a mission, for example, some of the mission of our foundation, we try to match our mission with our long-term sustainable um, profit interests as, a, as an institution. And some of the pension funds are finding that the actions of the corporations that are making these political contributions are actually undermining the duty of loyalty to their beneficiaries yeah. well, because they're against their interests. So the question is, is how do we separate out that agency issue? Because those issues really aren't recognized. There's no process that has been legally mandated that boards of directors have to go through in order to make these kinds of uh, contributions, nor a specific regime of accountability for when they make those um, decisions because of, all these, because of all these layers. When you go to the ultimate individual, the ultimate beneficiary of those pension funds, they're often harmed by the kinds of corporate expenditures that are made within the political area. But the problem is from the, from the board's point of view, it's got a whole range of shareholders with individual issues. I mean, you're a shareholder and you have, your, your foundation has certain goals and you find them undercut by what the board is doing. On the other hand, there may be other shareholders who have different in interests that are being fostered by what the board is doing. So their constituencies don't have a common interest except in stock price or return. So that's why they should, in my view, be focusing on, on those things and not on political action. I don't know the answer to how, if you get shareholders to adopt resolutions, they can't, maybe they won't be binding yet, that say, you know, no direct political contributions to campaigns, for example. I think that will, if directors have that kind of constraint and the, and the corporate lawyers go to the board and say you shouldn't be doing this and the general counsel says you shouldn't be doing this, you will cut down if not eliminate the amount of the activity that's covered by the... What's John? I'd like to hear John on this. He, <laughs> <laughs> well, by, so I, I'm agreeing mostly with what... I think the two of you are in agreement. I think the, the, the gap maybe between the perspectives is reflected in something that, Bill, you said earlier, which is... You said staggered boards, it's a type of takeover defense, have been going the way of the dodo. And you're right. And they're going that way because of institutional shareholder activists who brought resolutions. But it's taken 20 time. years, and it's been fought with resistance at every step. And, it's, and I, so I, I think that you know, you're right. In the end, this is the right outcome. It's going to be shareholder initiated, supplemented by legislation to make sure that at least disclosure is in place and enforcement to some extent can be made of the rules that get adopted. But it's going to take a long time. This is why I did my little statistical analysis, because it's going to need, <laughs> Tia Craft is going to need that in order for it as an institution to swing behind the idea of supporting these kinds of restraints. There are going to be lots, we're going to need other studies, and I, you know, I, I invite anyone to, to, to do the same kind of analysis, because I think in the long run, your intuition is right, but it's going to require a lot of convincing and a lot of effort to get there. It's, and I, so I, I think I will probably retire before we actually get to the right point uh, in this debate if we count on private action, which is one last point. We can, part of the reason the say on pay legislation was so important is that even though we were headed in the way that Dodd-Frank got us, it would have taken us another 20 years to get there to do what Dodd-Frank did in, in, well, it took them a year and a half, so not that fast, but pretty fast. Uh, and it, it's interesting, in this country it's very different, right? In UK, they got there much more quickly. Um, our political process, even before Citizens United, is sort of structured to be really slow. And 
all of this has to take place simultaneously in order for it to happen. So that, the reason I think for the different perspectives is it, I think Bill's, you know, you, you see the end point and, and you say, well, there, we're going to get there. But I'm a young man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to say we brought 14 of those resolutions on diversified boards in conjunction with Lucian Bebchek's organization, of which seven have now agreed. But this is what, uh, oh, 2025 oh, on diversified boards? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Board. yeah. So, uh, I mean, that is a very long process. I don't know if we have 25 years in which to deal with the political issues in that kind of process. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, the gentleman over here. Uh, Lance took one of my points, but I want to go a little beyond <laughs> that. I'm also representing a small institutional investor, the Christopher Reynolds Foundation, that's been very active. In this issue, we are in dialogue with Pfizer, we're in di dialogue with Accenture, we've signed a number of letters. We have approached the, uh, the companies. In fact, uh, and it really gets back to the fact that there's the direct expenditure, but as Lance pointed out, the um, principal and agent issue of the National Association of Manufacturers the, uh, and the, the chamber. A letter went out in January to, I think, 38 members of the board of the chamber, signed by 47 trillion, something like that. It was a, it was a big number. It was a big number. Uh, to the saying, look, you have stated positions on a number of things that are totally contrary to the positions of the board of the Chamber of Commerce. Tell us where you stand. And there's an old, you may not know Miles Law, which says uh, where you stand depends upon where you sit. And what we're finding is that these people are play standing in uh, many places and sitting in many places, and you don't know what's coming out of their mouths. Um, you get the easiest case is virtually every company now says climate is an important issue. But the board of the chamber has been trying to uh, do everything possible to get the EPA out of this business, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You all know that. Um, I think the last count, and now this is uh, three months after the letter went out, five companies had responded to that letter. And most of them said, oh, the, everything's fine because President Obama spoke to the Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> in, in a total non sequitur. <laughs> but, um, but the fact is, and they obviously was it because the, the line was the same line in every one of the. <laughs> The letters. So I don't want to suggest any collusion, <laughs> but uh, it may be there. Um, going back to say and pay for a moment, related to say and pay didn't just happen because every say on one of the important actors in say on pay was a a two year process supported by corporations, investors, and legal scholars meeting four to five times a year to try to work this out. Pfizer led on the corporate side, Walden Asset Management and Dominey and others, and then Steve Davis at, at Yale was there. So there was something that corporations were willing to sit down and talk about. The corporations don't want to sit down and talk about the, cor the political contributions, either at the level you were talking about it, namely directly, and certainly not indirectly. Then you go back to another corporate governance issue which you ha we haven't addressed. The board of the Chamber of Commerce has 125 people. That's not a board, that's a convention. <laughs> Committees. It's an audience. Yeah. Well, it's, it's uh, licensed to kill. Uh, and Tom Donahue has, is 007. Um, <clears throat> the uh, committees are 50 people. So what does that tell us about what's going to happen in this? And these companies need, you know, <clears throat> one company said to us, look, we believe uh, climate is an important issue, but it's not our most important issue as a business case. So we'll fight it if we can at the chamber, but I mean, all of this to say is I think there's a certain air of um, unreality about the conversation from the legal perspective. You're, sense of the benign quality of lobbying. You know, when, when a law is written in a congressman's office, that's not been, the independence of directors. We know what happens to directors. Uh, do, you so have, do you have a, the a question, question we is, need to wrap up? Yeah, I'm sorry. The question is, let's go to that principal agent issue and talk about how we can move that forward. 
from a legal perspective, I, I, and it's certainly, it's an ecosystem. We need the, the common causes and others operating in other ways, but where can you folks, as legal scholars, come in and help us? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> disclosure, right? That's, I think that's where we start, right? Start and end. Um, okay. I think, I think I've got 11 seconds. So, uh, so obviously, there's, no, there's, a, there's a lot of layers in your question. What I, what I would say is that um, uh, I think we all, it's, it's clear we all agree that the federal intervention is needed in the, on the disclosure front. I think what we're hearing from you, and by the way, this is consistent with conversations I've been having about this for a year now, is that um, the self-help remedy, the notion that markets and shareholders can do the work on their own, is uh, less straightforward than it might appear as a matter of theory. That's why we've proposed the kinds of things we proposed in our paper. That's why we proposed the use of independent directors. It's why we proposed the use of a shareholder voting right. And I can tell you from the Sayon Pay experience, before I started at Columbia, I was a, a, a lawyer at the Treasury Department, and I drafted the administration, the President's proposal for the Sayon Pay statute. And I was in a lot of the meetings you're talking about. And what I'll say about that is that the process, um, as John has said, is a very, very long process, right? So to me, what's encouraging about being here today is that those of you who are working on the Shareholder Protection Act and similar legislation have sort of got this process started because I can tell you, given the complexity of the issues, the challenges to the agency cost argument, I think it'll be a long time before, uh, before we get the kind of federal intervention we need. So it's, it, to me, it's encouraging that we've, we've at least started down that road. Okay, and on that note, uh, thank the panel for, for sharing their wisdom with us. I just wanted to announce that, uh, first of all, for those of you who want CLE credit, even for part of the day, please be sure to sign in and out and get, um, and if you don't have materials, copies are available. Um, secondly, the, um, we are serving lunch now, but I am told by the lunch people that they have, they are going to, because of the serving space and the limited amount of serving space, uh, we are going to be able to serve kind of in, you know, on a rolling basis. Uh, sandwiches will be replenished, but not magically by actual people as sandwiches are consumed. So if you can kind of stagger uh, the waves of lunch, but these staggering waves of lunch must end at 12.45 when our lunchtime keynote speaker, Charlie Cobb from the Committee on Economic Development, uh, will begin. Thank you.